Hello, this is Mrs Moss and today's lesson we're going to be looking at writing a speech with a viewpoint. The lesson objective for today is to know how to write an effective speech and what you're going to learn in the lesson is we're going to look at how to decode an exam task, we're going to understand how to construct a speech and we're going to practice writing to argue in a speech. If you need to, pause the screen now so that you can go and fetch yourself something to write with and some paper and also have a look at the glossary on the bottom left of your screen. The keywords there in bold, form, register and tone are important for today's lesson. So take some time to read the description of those words. If you do now task, have a look at the statement. How far do you agree with it? Now more than ever, it's important to take responsibility for your own actions. The reason I'm asking you to think about how far you agree with a statement like this is because in your exam, you'll be given a viewpoint and then you will have to do a task based on it, whether you're going to argue, explain or discuss. So you will need to form your own opinion based on what is given to you as a statement. In the middle of your screen is an example of how this exam question will look. So there is the statement that we had a look at in our do now task. Now more than ever, it's important to take responsibility for your own actions. And then your task that you've got to complete comes after that. So it, in this case, it's write a speech for a school public speaking competition to argue your point of view on this statement. Now, the first thing that you're going to need to do is to decode this question. In other words, you're going to have to think about what is this question actually asking you to do? And to help you do that today, there are four boxes, four orange boxes on the screen that will help you if you answer them to decode what the task is actually asking you to do. OK, so you're going to have a minute which will appear on the screen. And I want you to think about what the form, tone and register is. Now, you had those keywords in your glossary OK, that you looked at just a few moments ago. I want you to think about who's the audience. Minute starting now for you. I want you to think about, are you given any prompts in the question, any clues, any hints, if you like, as to what um, the question is asking you to include in your answer? And lastly, I want you to think about what is the purpose of your writing? So for that, you're really looking for a key word within it. Are you arguing? Are you explaining? Are you discussing? OK, so have a think about writing down a bullet point to those four questions to help you decode that task. And about halfway through your time. OK, and that's your minute complete. Now, it's really important that before you start writing for this type of question that you do decode it, because if you get any of those questions in the orange boxes incorrect, the, the thing that you're going to write essentially is not going to be what the examiner is looking for. Something in it may be incorrect. So let's now then self assess those answers. Let's have a look at what you should have come up with. So audience first, I'm starting in the top right hand box and then we're going to go round these clockwise. The audience is given to you in the question. It's a public speaking competition at a school. So your audience is going to probably be a mixture of students, teachers and parents. OK, so were we given any prompts? Well, it's interesting that this statement started off with now more than ever. Perhaps I think that it's trying to get you to include recent events and how this may have impacted your ideas about responsibility. Uh, what's the purpose? Well, you can see the keyword in the bottom from last line, which is to argue. OK, so that's what we're doing. It's an argument that we're writing. What was the form? We're told clearly in the question that it's a speech. What does my tone need to be given the audience of it? It needs to be formal. And the register, what type of language am I looking at? It's language that you would use in a classroom. OK, quite formal tone and a register would also be formal types of language. Just to look at prompts a bit further then. 
it said now, I've highlighted that word in orange for you, now more than ever. Have a look at those images on the screen. This really would be a nice question to get in an exam situation because we have so many recent events that we can comment on. Perhaps you want to talk about with this how it's been everybody's responsibility jointly as a community to work through the difficulties of the coronavirus. Perhaps you'd like to talk about the fact um, that now more than ever, it's important to stand up to racism and to not let things go by and to quite rightly say when things are wrong and link that to the Black Lives Matter movement. You could link it perhaps to um, pollution and indeed the battle against plastics that, that hits the headlines quite often recently. You could make it more personal to you about how you felt that it was your responsibility to stay safe. And the fact that schools have been closed recently and that you've been doing a lot of home learning, perhaps you could use that as your opportunity to talk about how it's been your responsibility to learn. OK. So now let's think about what makes an effective speech. In the box in the middle of your screen, you have a success criteria, but I haven't told you which part of each line is the correct part to include for a speech. For example, on the first line, should I include similes, metaphors and descriptive techniques, or am I looking at including a forest techniques? OK, I'm going to give you a minute to do this task. It's appearing on the screen now. It might be an idea to write your answers on your paper so that you have a success criteria to refer to. As a challenge, if you're doing that quite quickly, have a think about effective speeches that you've either heard, listened to or that you've seen and think about why they were effective and how they made an impact on you. Okay, just coming to the end of your time now, so you should be looking at memorable statements, what should we include and how should we address the listener or reader. Okay, now let's look at those answers together. So on your paper, make sure that you correct your success criteria if you got these answers incorrect. So firstly, for this type of question, we're looking for the use of a forest techniques. Don't worry if you can't remember them, we're going to revise them shortly. We are looking for structure with paragraphs that has discourse markers and connectives. We're looking for a variety of sentence lengths and structures. You will need to think about using varied and accurate spelling and punctuation. A nice feature would be to use short memorable statements that are used to frame the argument. And you will need to address the audience. OK, no need for a written address here because we're told it's a speech. We need to imagine we're speaking this out loud. And you may have thought about for the challenge task, some speeches that you've heard or listened to that were really impactful. I've included in the box on the screen now some speeches that are readily available on YouTube that it is a good idea to listen to because you can really glean from that and um, powerful features that you can use in your own writing. You may have thought about, for example, the I Have a Dream Martin Luther King speech. Another really useful one is Winston Churchill's Fighting on the Beaches. You might have a look, listen to Gandhi's speech about Quit, Quit India. And recent one that I thought was very impactful for me was the Queen's Address to the Nation. Uh, we'll, meet, we'll meet again. OK, so really good idea to have a listen to some of those speeches for a little bit of extra home learning. For your next task, let's have a look at the difference between connectives and discourse markers. So a connective is a word or phrase that connects and relates sentences and paragraphs to each other, whereas a discourse marker is a word or phrase that's used to manage what we say or write to express our attitude. Okay? So the main difference is the discourse marker helps to express your attitude, or if you like, your point of view, which is really important for a task like the one that I've given you. 
On your paper, I'd like you to draw a table as suggested by the orange one that you can see on the screen. So two columns, two headings at the top, connectives and discourse markers. And for your next task, I'd like you to have a go at sorting the words and phrases in the grey box into the table. As a challenge, try and think about your own examples and add them into the correct column. OK, pause your screen now to complete that task and then join me when you've finished and we'll look at the answers together. OK, so in the left hand side, connectives are firstly, secondly, penultimately, finally. Whereas you can see in the discourse markers, some people believe, some argue that, nevertheless, even though, we know that in the rest of the paragraph, we're going to have a very clear point of view expressed. OK, now to get higher marks in a, level, in a question such as this one, we need to be using a mixture of both, especially discourse markers, because that shows that you're really trying to emphasise your point of view and that you are indeed arguing as the task asked you to do. Now let's revise the AFORIS techniques. I don't want you to spend lots of time writing down the definitions of each of these because I do feel that every year so far at school you have looked at these in lessons. So hopefully this is just a quick revision exercise for you. So on your page for this task, I want you to write down what each letter of the AFORIS acronym stands for. So what is the A word that is a short, interesting story about a real incident or person? On the bottom left of your screen, you've got your minute now. So start writing those words that link to the definitions for what each letter in A forest stands for. I have a challenge task for you. This is not an exhaustive list of all of the techniques. So can you think of other rhetorical devices that you could write in this type of um, task, a speech with a viewpoint? about halfway through your time. If you've done that really quickly, think about that challenge task. What other rhetorical devices could you use in a question like this? OK, let's have a look at some of the answers then. So on your paper, you should have written down anecdote. It's a short, interesting story about a real incident or person. The F stands for facts. The truth about the issue, which is often presented simply for a really strong impact. Opinions. This is a person's viewpoint on an issue. Obviously, you'll need this for your answer. If you're very clever, though, you'll make it look like the only viewpoint. Um, a rhetorical question we know is a question that doesn't need an answer, often because you've already given it in your response. Exaggeration is a statement that presents something overly better or worse than it is. Statistics, numbers. So we're looking at things like percentages and ratios that you can use to strengthen your argument. And triples, when you use the same three words or similar phrases to emphasise a point. Um, did you have a go at the challenge task? You might have come up with some more examples like repetition or personal pronouns, modal verbs like must, should, would, could, and of course emotive language for a task such as this. Let's have a look at spotting some of these techniques in an example paragraph. And this is a paragraph that you could write in response to the exam task that we've been looking at. As I read it to you, I want you to try and spot where we've used opinions that are being presented as facts, a rhetorical question, an example of triples and some personal pronouns. And as a challenge, can you see where I've used idioms or metaphors to strengthen the argument? OK, so have a listen out for those as we start reading it now. It's a simple truth that all human beings, young and old alike, make mistakes and poor choices. The same goes when we fail to act when we know we should. There are times when we all look the other way, when we know the right thing to do is take helpful action. We should first understand one thing. We're not the first person, nor will we be the last, who has fallen short in the choices we've made. Why do we fall short? 
It's a simple truth that when things go wrong, too many of us refuse to hold up our hands, look at ourselves in the mirror, remove our heads from the sand. The hands stay in our pockets. We avoid the mirror altogether and prefer to stay submerged in our denial. But now, more than ever, it's time to brush off the sands of denial and take responsibility for our actions. OK, so let's have a little look then and see where those four techniques were. So we're starting off with an opinion presented as a fact. And we've done that by using a strong opening statement. I'm going to highlight that for you now. It's a simple truth that. So this is an opinion, but by using that phrasing and that discourse marker, I've made that seem as a fact. As we move on to the second paragraph, we have an example of a rhetorical question. Why do we fall short? And it's an example of rhetoric because I've answered that question with the sentence that follows it and using another rhetoric device, repetition, with using the same phrasing. It's a simple truth to answer the question. The triples are three phrases that are the same in this instance. So we can have a look at it here where we say we refuse to hold up our hands. That's number one. Look at ourselves in the mirror. That's number two. And we move our heads from the sand is number three. Lastly, let's have a look at some personal pronouns. The ones that we've got used here are inclusive. Inclusive comes from the word to include because words such as personal pronouns such as we, our, means that it's everybody's responsibility and we're making that the audience feel included in the points that we're making. For the challenge task then, the idioms and metaphor were in the second paragraph. An idiom is a well-known phrase, if you like, that we would use, such as hold up your hands, look at yourself in the mirror or remove your head from the sand. And what's been used in <clears throat> this argument is the metaphor of um, having um, being in denial and having your head stuck in the sand. And it's used in a extended version here where we use it here to say prefer to stay submerged in our denial and brushing off the sands of denial. So they're used to strengthen the argument in this response. Let's have a look at another part of the success criteria, which was to use varied and accurate punctuation. And I'm going to show you today an example of how you can use a colon and also a semicolon. When I finish talking, I suggest that you pause the screen so that you can practice writing these two examples and your own examples down on your page. Let's talk about a colon first then. So that's in the left hand column. And an easy way to use it would be to introduce an example or an explanation. Um, so we've got here a healthy lifestyle is clearly important. Then we have the colon and then I've listed um, points in an explanation such as a balanced diet, comma, regular exercise and being aware of your mental health are all key components. On the right hand side, we have the use of a semicolon. And a good way to use these is to balance an argument or to contrast two equally related statements within a sentence. To do this, you need to make sure that each sentence either side of your semicolon makes sense on it on its own. For example, a healthy lifestyle is clearly important, semicolon, an unhealthy lifestyle is often preferred. So what I suggest now is that you pause your screen. I've given you the same framing to use your colon and semicolon. So do use the start of sentences and you need to fill in the gaps to link with the task that we're completing today. So remember, we're linking it to is responsibility important? OK, have a go and then join us again to have a look at some answers after you've finished. Hopefully you found that quite an easy task to do using that framework. So we've got taking responsibility is clearly important, colon, and ability to acknowledge our faults, taking ownership over the effects of our choices and realising the role we play in our own lives are all key components. You don't have to have exactly the same words that I've used, of course. And if you struggled, have a look at that example, pause the screen and write that down. It's something that you could use in your answer to the task. How did you get on with the semicolon? I came up with taking responsibility is clearly important. Shirking that responsibility is often preferred. Shirking is a good word to use in this task because it means that we avoid taking responsibility for something.
try and use those in your writing to the exam style question. There's a challenge to other examples of punctuation that you could use to add variety would be ellipsis to create a deliberate and quite dramatic pause. Remember, we're speaking out loud. So if you're leading up and building up to a big or shocking point, um, ellipsis can be used really effectively to show this in your writing. Or you can add brackets. If you went back um, a few minutes ago to the example paragraph that I used, I included quite a bit of rhetoric and quite a lot of um, viewpoint through my use of brackets and you can use that to add that extra information into your sentences. Another important point of a speech is thinking about the construction as a whole and for a speech what is essential is that you need to have a strong beginning and a strong ending and it's also good if you're being rhetorical and as a rhetoric de device to repeat those phrases throughout. So having said that, have a look on the left hand side at that box. These are strong beginnings that you could use. So it's a simple truth that imagine a world where you can't say it, but you know it's true. How many of us can say dot 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 or picture this? Now you could use those repeated through paragraphs throughout your argument, as I said, as a rhetorical device. But I want you to have a go at completing the endings. The first two I've done for you. So I might start my speech off by saying it's a simple truth that, but at the end, I might have a sentence by itself by saying the truth is that simple. Or in other words, haven't I just proven my point in that speech that you've listened to? Similarly, imagine a world where dot, dot, dot. And at the end of my speech, I might return to that with some rhetoric by saying, now, just imagine that world. Again, almost as if saying I've proved my point. I haven't completed the last three. So pause the screen now and have a go at completing the last three endings. You must, now many of us, and now you can. Press play on your screen when you've had a go at completing those. So an example might be, you must say it because it's true. Now many of us can say, and you might um, there reiterate a statement that's really important for this task. Now, many of us can say that it's important to be responsible for your own actions. Now you can picture it. Again, really strong ending, reinforcing through that rhetoric that you've proved your point and your viewpoint in your speech. So have a go today when you're answering your, ex your exam question at using the strong beginnings, using them again repeated throughout your answer, and using a strong ending to your speech as well. Next part of our success criteria then is looking at showing an awareness of an audience. When we decoded the task, we understood, didn't we, that we have a mixed audience here of probably students, teachers um, and parents. Now I'm gonna show you a little trick here if you like. To show an awareness, awareness of the audience, sorry, um, you can use phrases that show that you understand that this is being spoken out loud and it's not something that's going to be read, um, for example, like a letter. Quick task to do, and again, you'll need to pause the screen to write these down and to complete the sentences, is try and think of words that are from the lexical field of listening to complete the sentences, okay? You've got four to complete, and there's a challenge if you find those quite quick and easy to do. Try and think about some examples of your own where you're referring or to the audience or that you're showing an awareness of this being a spoken text, not a written text. Have a go, pause the screen and join us again when you've finished your answers. Okay, so for the first example you might have, thank you for listening. And you could use that at the end of your speech to sign off. Definitely do not use phrases such as yours sincerely, yours faithfully. That would be required for a letter. This is a speech. Next, you may be shocked, surprised to hear that. Again, showing an awareness that, that you're speaking it out loud and that your audience is listening. The facts can sometimes be less difficult to listen to. Similar to number two. And I'm here today to speak to you about, okay, you could use that in an introductory paragraph at the start of your speech. 
Hopefully you thought of some examples of your own. If not, use those four in your work today. And the examiner will really like that because you've shown that you've decoded the text, and the task, sorry, and that you are fully aware that this is a spoken text with an audience that's listening to you. So here's that exam question again for you. Now more than ever, it's important to take responsibility for your own actions. Write a speech for a school public speaking competition to argue your point of view on this statement. To help you on the screen, I've included the part of the task that we decoded. So the fact that you need to write a speech, that it needs to be a formal, that your register needs to be language you would use in a classroom. You know that you've got an audience of students, teachers and parents. You know that your purpose is to argue. That's the key word in the question. I would suggest for a question like this that you agree with the viewpoint there. And we argue that it is important to take responsibility for actions. And the prompts I've included in the four images, perhaps these could be four paragraphs in your response. So think about how with school closures, it has been your responsibility to take action about your own learning. You could use some anecdotal evidence there and talk about how that impacted you and how that made you feel. Similarly, you could talk about the fact that it has been your responsibility to make sure that your community, your family is safe. OK, could you use that slogan from the coronavirus poster? We all must do it to get through it. That could be a clever link into your paragraph to talk about how you've been responsible there. Have a think about the Black Lives Matter movement, how it is everybody's responsibility to not let racism go unseen. And have a think about that image of world pollution how it's your responsibility to also make sure that you are recycling materials, that, they, that you're not overusing plastics. They're just some ideas. You may come up with some of your own and that's absolutely fine, but you could there are, use those there for four strong paragraphs. Take a screenshot or pause your screen now. You will need to spend about five minutes or so planning your answer, at least 40 minutes writing your answer as well. When you've completed your answer, join us again for the end of the lesson. We'll be self-assessing our work. Good luck. Well done for writing your speech. On the screen in front of you now, we've got the success criteria that we looked at in the lesson. Use it to check your work. Did you include a forest techniques? Did you have clear paragraphs? Have you got some discourse markers and connectives there? Did you use a variety of sentence lengths and structures? How about accurate spelling and punctuation? Did you include some sentences with colons, semicolons? Did you challenge yourself and include brackets and ellipsis? Well done if you did. Did you use some short memorable statements like the one we looked at, like the ones we looked at in the lesson to frame your argument? Did you use them throughout to build the rhetoric? It'd be really good if you did. And did you use some of those key phrases to help you address the audience to show the examiner that you know that the form is a speech and that this is a spoken text? If you didn't do all of the success criteria, write it for yourself as a target now. And for further revision and for further ideas with writing effective speeches with viewpoints, I've included that box again with some suggestions that you could watch and have a listen to.